on a former player. I told him, son, what is it with you? Is it ignorance or apathy? And he said, coach, I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> No sense of humor this morning. Come on, please. <laughs> Here's my personal favorite. Pat Williams, Orlando. <laughs> this is a good one. Pat Williams, Orlando Magic general manager on his team's 7 and 27 record. We can't win at home. We can't win on the road. As general manager, I just can't figure out where else to play. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, love right. it. <laughs> Let's get rolling. All right. Well, if you have some of your some of your own wish, yeah, it's fine. All right. So, thanks for coming out uh, this morning, my hearty friends, hardy friends. Um, if uh, does anyone have a laptop open? We are broadcasting, so um, it should be the email address I sent out last yesterday evening. Um, I, I guess I could log in and find. So if, if you're interested to do it, it's uh, whatever I sent out yesterday evening, I guess. Uh, where is it? I guess the university isn't closed, right? I don't know. I guess there's no... Um, where was it yesterday? Oh, there it is. Oh, I don't see it. Oh, I guess it was in mail, wasn't it? Because it goes out through Angel. So this, so if you log into this email address, you would find us. And so obviously you don't need to do that if you're here. But uh, do do you use Adobe Connect in any of your classes to do online stuff remotely? So I could be sitting. You could be sitting in your apartments, in your pajamas, eating donuts and drinking coffee or coke or beer for that matter if you want. And I could be doing the same. And uh, we could be tele tele connected, I guess, but if you want. So if you uh, Want to have a look at this, you can if you have a computer here. It's moot if you're here, of course. I'm curious as to whether, I guess a, a screen does come up for this, where I can see, oh yeah, there are some people there. So, they're running away as soon as we opened it, but uh, are any of these guys here? No? Okay, someone's off, off. someone is online. I guess I'm hoping that, uh, I guess I didn't do... Yeah, anyway, enough of that. So it doesn't matter for you guys, right? So, and we don't care about that. So, well, I hope um, we do get to do the test. I don't know what you hope, but I think we probably want to just get out of the way, right? I think uh, it would be great if everything works out tomorrow. I'm not sure what's going to happen, um, but hopefully it, it works out. They don't close down the university. If they do close down the university, then we'll postpone it. Uh, we won't postpone it a week ahead because that's uh, polling day and you need to do your duty. And so maybe on the Monday or something, whenever, whenever we can get a room. Uh, but hopefully that it's, as far as I think right now, it's still uh, scheduled for uh, tomorrow at 6.30. So, so it's hopefully, are those the guys in car talk? Is that what I hear? Did I not turn them off? Yeah, I thought I heard some strange noise. Well, obviously, uh, Hurricane um, Sandy is moving in. It's going to... Uh, sit on top of us, I think, for a while, an unusual trajectory. Um, some of it has relevance, obviously, is a big fluid mechanics problem. We talked about fluid mechanics problems before. Uh, last time we had a hurricane that um, was co-located with this class, we talked about the storm surge, how we could rationalize that on the fact that the low pressure in the center of a storm uh, would actually basically suck up the water uh, in the center of it by amount given by the uh, departure, if you like, from the atmospheric conditions. Normal atmospheric pressure is about 1,000 millibars. I think this storm is unusually low. Apparently, the center of the storm will give the lowest pressures ever recorded in New York City and Philly, uh, ever. I mean, in the <coughs> instrumental record, which is about 950 so it's, uh, millibars. So it's about 50 millibars uh, below normal atmospheric pressure. And we have done something now that kind of explains some of that. And it relates to the idea that if you take a packet of air and you swing it around on a string, there's tension in that string. And so you can imagine that if you have to apply tension in that string according to Bernoulli's equation, which is this radial equation here, which we've talked about in the past, then if we go horizontally, then um, there is no change in elevation as you go normally outwards. So in other words, on a horizontal plane, 
then you can basically write the two components of this, say that these parts and this part, the changes of these, so it's not the Bernoulli equation, but it's the differential form of the Bernoulli equation, which is equal to zero, those changes have to be equal and opposite to each other. Um, we have this radial coordinate system, which is radially outwards. We have this normal coordinate system, which you remember is radially inwards. Um, so this is this here is equal to minus r, so you can just do this transformation, just changes the sign. And basically you have this expression which defines how <coughs> pressures change as you move radially into or outwards from the, the uh, center of a, a rotating air mass, which happens to be a hurricane. And so you can make some suppositions about what the velocities might be. A normal one would be this one, right? So in other words, you have a piece of string with some air on it. If you're twisting it around, the part close in is going at a small velocity, the part going outside to keep up, so it all moves, basically sweeps like my arm, all moving at the same rotational rate. Then it'd be small in the middle, and it'd be much larger on the outside. And if you plug this into the ex expression and integrate it, then you end up, you can see this for yourself, this is in your notes, of course, one that increases and the pressure goes up and up and up as you go further out radially from the eye of the storm. And if you take a different random uh, velocity distribution where you have a big velocity in the middle, which you'd kind of expect with this intense flows. And as you go outside, the velocities become basically ambient zero velocities, these rotational velocities. Then you get a distribution that looks like this. And the expressions for this and the integrations are, are down here. I think it's this one for this particular one. And so you can define exactly why, as a result of this uh, air mass being put in motion by the Coriolis effect in the Earth, uh, that you get this low pressure at the center, and it goes to some background ambient. This would be about 1,000 millibars. So what does Zachary say? Did you catch that before he just retreated in the bottom right? He says, does anyone have such and such? <coughs> and so 1,000 millibars on the outside, and you could do calculations to see if indeed it is... 950 millibars on the inside, right? One, so one bar is equal to uh, 10 to the 5 pascals, newtons per meter squared. So you could play some games to figure out exactly what's going on. But the, the mechanics of what's going on is that it's being spun around just like something on a string. The string has tension on it. That means that you're applying a pressure to pull it in. That pressure basically is this tension, uh, is that there's a force which is larger as you go out here and you're pulling it back to be able to keep it all uh, coherent. Uh, to, and it's just the, the way that you get this low uh, in the center of a tornado, I think, or a hurricane. They're just different uh, rotation speeds and different scales, obviously, to each other. So that's kind of what's, what's going on for this. All right. Um, so any questions, actually, from what we had on, on Friday? I tried to post the stuff on Friday, uh, and it uploaded it, but it didn't show it. So I'll do that again today. So I wasn't trying to keep it off um, the YouTube channel, per se. But it just didn't load in, in the time that I was here on Wednesday. That's uh, Friday, rather. And it's too slow for my house to be, able, to be able to do it. And I'm guessing my house is going to be dark tonight, since we live in the woods, which some would say is the best place for me. All right, so you should feel good that you've, you know, you've covered, we've covered a lot of ground in this class uh, so far. All right, um, so barring no, no questions, uh, we're talking about uh, dim dimensional analysis. Uh, we introduced it last time with the idea that you could put a scale model into a flow and measure some properties on that scale model, such as velocities applied to the flow over it and measure forces for lift and drag and be able to figure out whether something was uh, flying or not, was able to have enough lift to be able to take off, was basically the moral of that story. And so that can be applied to a whole bunch of uh, different models to be able to, to measure those behaviors. And so what uh, I wanted to do today was to talk about a formal way of being able to figure out what these um, ratios of forces are, which we introduced last time. And so a formal way of being able to figure out exactly what these properties are. What we'll find is that in this general way, where we don't have to derive any equations 
to be able to figure out exactly what the interrelationships of different parameters in an experiment are. Uh, we can use a formal way to do it, and what will come out of it is that we will end up basically recovering these different numbers. The Reynolds number, which is perhaps the most important number, because it gives us scaling for the velocities that we should apply to a model that will give us the same flow field around it. And then if we're looking at forces that are applied on a structure, the Euler number allows us to get the forces and scale the forces of lift and drag on a structure uh, if it's completely immersed in a fluid. And the Froude number allows us basically to do that for the case where it's a free surface flow. So in other words, it's a ship going on top of a free surface. And so that's basically where we'll come out of this. But the, the model that I wanted to use is, um, you could think of it, what we're going to do is we're going to look at, say, flow in a pipe, because we'll spend a bit of time looking at flows in pipes, because they're relevant to pipelines, they're relevant to poor scale models of um, fluid flow. And so what Buckingham Pi method allows us to do is it allows us to make relationships between the physical variables which control a system and each other. So we can do a minimum number of experiments, basically. Do a minimum number of experiments and then be able to scale those experiments to be able to account for cases that we haven't quite done experiments for, is basically the, the, the idea. And so if you think about a pipe, what we have to do is think only of the physical properties that we think control the behavior. So what, if we're looking at pipe flow, uh, what would those properties be? Um, it'd be velocity. It might be uh, the density of the fluid. It might be the viscosity of the fluid. Um, it might be gravity, but let's not worry about uh, that for now. Um, and it might be the pressure that we apply between the upstream and downstream. And so this is going to follow the, the example you have in your notes. Uh, but this is the pressure divided by the length over which it flows. So length of pipe. And we're going to call this delta P sub L. Because uh, it's pressure drop per unit length. And some other characteristic dimension which might be this diameter. And so if you look on... Uh, well, I'm right in the wrong place, I guess. I have one of these. I should be writing here. But this is the example that we're doing. So it's just the geometry of a... Of a uh, so if you want to, you can follow this. I'm just going to do it free range. And so I didn't mean to do it on this particular one here, but I guess that will be fine. So the other thing that you could do is you could think of this as, if you wanted to, think of this as a pipe like this, but a pipe that's closed. Right? And we talked last time about an airfoil. So what, if you think of this as a solid steel pipe, you could think also about the flow that you get around this, kind of the external flow, which is kind of the inverse pipe, if you like. And this would be a velocity. This would be um, a diameter, if you like. And the reason I mention that is because it's not very different from this. So the point is that we can look at these problems and in terms of these variables that we're describing it by, the variables, the five variables or so that we've described here, density of the fluid, viscosity of the fluid, some characteristic dimension of the pipe, some characteristic size of the piece of this, and this might be some characteristic height of the, the airfoil. Or there's nothing more that's said about these systems other than the fact that it has some characteristic dimension that defines it. A flow field velocity. And of course, in this case, you know that where it hits this stagnation point, there'd be a pressure here that you develop, and there'd be less pressure at the back. So there would be a pressure gradient along the length of this. Just as it's driving flow here, it would come as a consequence of killing velocity. If you're looking at a, um, an airfoil, you'd have the same thing. You'd have a pressure, a stagnation point here, and therefore, along this length, you'd also have delta P over L which would be the force you'd have to push with this, this airfoil with to be able to move it through the air. Or in other words, if the air was flowing past it and you're holding it static, it's the force you have to, to hold it with. And so we've said nothing yet about the geometry of these, except that they're defined by these uh, variables. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use these four variables to be able to figure out, sorry, these five variables, to figure out exactly how they're interrelated. 
And so I'm probably going to run out of space here, but uh, so I might switch to this just because it's a bit easier. And so it really is 9.2, right? <clears throat> and so we're going to talk about Buckingham Pie. Named for Mr. Buckingham. And the Greek letter. Um, so let's just remind ourselves of this diameter, length, a velocity, however you want to look at that, sorry. That's not a velocity, is it? Uh, control Z. And the fluid properties were density and viscosity. And we had a pressure change between the upstream delta P, uh, which we're going to define as delta P over L. And this variable we'll call delta P sub L. Bless you. So what Buckingham Pi theory says is that if you have um, k parameters, in this case we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, which in our case is 5, and these represent n groups of mass, length, and time. In other words, the variables. Remember that? Um, which in our case will show this, but it's actually three. Well, density has kilograms per length cubed, so we have mass and length in that. And velocity, for instance, has time in it. And so, in other words, we can describe our system by k minus n groups, dimensionless groups, which is equal to 5 minus 3, which is equal to 2. And so what we end up with is two dimensionless groups that will absolutely define our system. And so now we need to figure out exactly what those groups are. So what we'll do is we're going to say that basically we can relate this pressure change with length, this parameter here, as some function of the other variables. And the other variables are de uh, diameter, the flow velocity, the density and the viscosity of the fluid. And so what we want is a formal way to be able to figure out exactly how these re are related. <clears throat> so we have to figure out, first of all, what the, mag the individual parameters are that describe each of these features. So delta PL is going to be the change in pressure with the length. Let's write them out. Um, diameter is going to be an easy one. Velocity is going to be an easy one. Density is going to be an easy one. And viscosity is going to be less easy. So let's do the easy ones. Diameter, units of length. Velocity, length per unit time. Density is kilograms per meter cubed. Uh, and the other ones. So what's this? So how do we do that? Pressure over length is equal to force over area, right? Which is equal to pressure divided by length. Force over area is equal to mass times acceleration over area times 1 over L. And hopefully, so mass is mass. Acceleration is meters per second squared. Area is length minus 2. Length is length minus 1. Is that everything? And so that should be, uh, we get rid of this and this. So it's, let's do it MLT. So mass, length minus 2, and t minus 2. Someone might want to check in our other notes whether that's true. What about viscosity? Uh, well, viscosity, you could either do it from Newton's law, which is shear stress is equal to viscosity times velocity over length. But it's probably easier just to know that the units of viscosity 
or Pascal seconds. You just have to do this however you can best do it. A Pascal is uh, a Newton <coughs> per meter squared times seconds. A Newton is what? The force required to give uh, a kilogram an acceleration of one <coughs> meter per second squared. So this has to be the units of Newtons. Uh, mass meter squared is length minus two and seconds is time. So we have one unit of mass out of here. We have length minus one, is that right? And we have time minus one. And so this is a, so this, so does anyone, does anyone check those? I think they're, they look about right, but it's probably useful to figure it out. Does anyone, are those right? Anyone checked with the other notes? No? Okay, so we'll just forge ahead. So what we want to do is we want to be able to now figure out what the dimensionless variables are. It's really quite an amazing thing to do. And so what we want to do is we want to choose, uh, we know two things. We know uh, there will be two pi groups, or two pi terms. This is basically this here. And we'll call those pi 1 and pi 2, just as out of formality. And so what we're going to do is we're going to choose three variables, and we're going to choose the simplest variables we have here. So this is units of length, this is length over time, and this is mass over length cubed. So these we'll call our repeating variables. So it's just, this is just a recipe. And uh, those should be the simplest, dimensionally simplest, I guess. Simplest. And so what we're going to do is we're going to write two pi groups. The first pi group will involve the dependent variable and the three simplest values. And then the second pi group will include this other variable and the three repeating variables. So, so that's basically what we're going to do. So the recipe is this. So the pi 1 says that Delta P L times D times V times rho. Uh, and we want this to be a dimensionless group which will have units of mass, length, and time. But we want it to be dimensionless. So it has to have zero units of mass, zero units of length, and zero units of time. And so what we're going to do is we're going to combine these by multiplying them, or actually not by multiplying them, but by raising them to an exponent, so that when we multiply them together, we get exactly this distribution of, of mass, length, and time. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply, raise this to the power A, raise this to the power B, and raise this to the power C. Did anyone check whether these are right? Uh, I didn't. Uh, they are good, because so, otherwise we're beating ourselves for no good reason. And so what we're going to do is we're going to write out each of these in terms. So the magnitudes of pressure gradient are mass length minus 2, T minus 2, <coughs> to the one, if you like. The units of diameter are going to be length to the power a. The units of velocity are going to be length times time to the minus one to the power b. And the units of density are mass 
and length to the minus 3, all raised to the power c. And the units of these, if you like, have to equal mlt 0, 0, 0. So the basic idea is to be able to write three simultaneous equations that we can solve that each take care of, of one of these terms. So the first one is mass. And we're going to do it for mass, we're going to do it for length, and we're going to do it for time. And so what is this? So mass. So mass to the 1 uh, plus mass in this one is 0 to the a, and mass in this one is well, actually not 0. This is going to be, we're going to add the individual powers. So this is mass to the 1, which is 1. Um, units of mass in this are 0. Yeah, sorry. Units of this are 0. And the units of this are mass to the power c. Has to equal this. So we're just summing, if you like, the individual exponents of these <coughs> multiplied by how many times it occurs in the brackets. In terms of length, we have minus 2 times 1. We have a. We have b. And we have plus minus 3c equals 0. And in terms of time, we have minus 2, we have 0, we have minus b, should write, just write it as minus b, I guess. And um, third one, this is for time, it's nothing, right? And so what we can do is then we can figure out exactly what these mean. So c plus 1 is equal to 0, so c is equal to minus 1. If c is, well, we don't need that yet. Um, so we add b to the right-hand side, so b is equal to minus 2. And if b is equal to minus 2, and if c is equal to minus 1, then what's that give us? It gives us minus 2, 3 times minus 1 is minus 3, which is plus 3, minus 2 gives us plus 1, uh, plus minus 2 is minus 1 plus a equals 0, so a is equal to 1, is that right? Thank you. Let's see if it is. And so now we have these terms, and so what we can do is we can resubstitute it back into here. So our dimensionless parameter is going to be, we called it pi 1, which is going to be delta p, the pressure change with length to the power 1. It's going to be the diameter, whoops, stop it. It's going to be the diameter to the power a. It's going to be the velocity to the power b. And it's going to be the density to the power c, which is equal to delta pl d over v squared rho. And uh, I don't know why that comes on the bottom. So in other words, you could also write this as delta p over l, which is what this term is, right? times d over rho v squared, which is also delta p over rho v squared times just algebra, right? Times d over l. This is, what's this? You've seen this before. This is the Euler number. Okay? It's just come out of it as a natural consequence. And this is just the ratio of two lengths. So it's something about the geometry. So we've got one pi term which tells us what's going on, um, but there's another one that we need to figure out as well because we said that we have two. 
So what's come out of it is a natural way of being able to figure out one, one non-dimensional variable. Um, if we do it again, so now we said there are two pi terms. So now we have these repeating variables, which we use again and again and again. That's what repeating means. And now instead of using the dependent variable, we use the other variable that we, we had before. And so uh, the pi 2 term would be, I guess I'm going to lose, maybe I'll just make this smaller so I can see both at the same time. So the second pi term is going to be something like this. Pi 2 is going to be equal to, we'll replace this with viscosity, and we'll use the same repeating terms. D, velocity, density, to the power A, B, C, and we want this to equal mass, length, and time, each to the power zero, and we can just go through the same thing as before. The only thing that changes now, we use, use viscosity. What was viscosity? Mass, length, minus one, time, minus one. So this now is mass, length, minus one, time, minus one, uh, multiplied by one, to the exponent one, and the other ones will be just the same. It's going to be length to the power a, it's going to be velocity, which is length over time to the minus 1 to the power of b. And it's going to be density, which is mass length minus 3 to the power of c. And you go through this again. Um, so we know, uh, well, I don't know, do you want me to do it or do you want to just refer to the notes? Notes? Okay. Non-committal? Well, so anyway, so you, you go through it. Perhaps it's easier just to show it in the notes. And so we, they, they do follow it exactly. And so if you have the notes here, basically what we've done is we've gone through this first case. We've come out with this number. We rearranged it slightly. So we ended up with v squared rho over delta p. D over L is what we had, right? And so now what we've done is we've exchanged this value for the pressure with viscosity, <coughs> which is down here. And we do exactly the same as we did before. All of these terms, right, on this to the right-hand side of this are going to be exactly the same as they were previously. I, can't, well, I guess I can make it smaller also. You can see that this matrix here, this... And this, all these terms are exactly the same as before. All that will change is the stuff in this first column. Originally, this was for the pressure drop with length. Now it's for the viscosity. So this is for the viscosity. And so you see it for the mass term, it's mass to the power 1. For the length term, it's length to the power minus 1. And for the time term, it's time to the minus 1. And so again, you can do that. We get the value of C directly from this. We get the value of B directly from this. And if we know C and B, then we can solve for the value of, of A, which we don't know. And so we end up with another exponent, uh, or series of exponents. If we apply these values of A, A, B, and C into this expression here, we end up with a term, and the term is this one. And of course, this term, as you know, is one of the Reynolds number. And so we said before that there's some important non-dimensional terms which come into play, and we've found a way of being able to basically do this to be able to, to figure out exactly what those terms are. And the two terms in our particular case are the magnitudes of, they're actually combined terms, right? So this is one pi term. This is what we're calling pi 1. And actually it's this, the product of two individual terms. It's a product of a dimensionless term, which is the ratio of two lengths, something said about geometry, and something said about the forces that are applied on the structure. And the second pi term is something that says something about the, uh, the ratio of, uh, as we said before, the Reynolds number is the ratio of the inertial forces, which is the change in velocity, to the viscous forces. And if you remember before, the, the, how we introduced this was we had this figure here, which basically said that 
At any given Reynolds number, whether you're flowing water or air or molasses, perhaps not molasses, or gasoline, the flow field will look exactly the same at any Reynolds number, any given Reynolds number. So if uh, you change the, the fluid, but you bring it up the velocity so that when you multiply these numbers together, uh, the Reynolds number is the same in either case, then the flow field will look like this. Likewise, if you double the size of this um, uh, rod, and you flow, what would you have to do? So if you double the size of this rod, but you fl flowed fluid at half the speed, then you'd also be at the same Reynolds number, and the flow field would look exactly like this, but it'd be scaled up. So the, the one important number, the most important number that we need to deal with is the Reynolds number, because it defines the flow field around the system. And if the flow field around the system looks the same for our model in the tank or in the air tunnel, as it does for our prototype structure in reality, then at least we have a fighting chance of somehow being able to convert the forces that are applied on that and scale them to the real value. And the parameter which allows us to, 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 to convert the forces is going to be this Euler number because it relates pressures divided by a density of the fluid and the velocity squared. And of course, a pressure is equal to what, what is it? Pressure is equal to um, a force, P divided by area I'm running out of space, times 1 over rho v squared. Right? So this is a force, right? So in other words, if you apply a force on this to hold this in place, which is uppercase big P, which you probably can't see very well, then you could mag evaluate the, the magnitude of this would be and the area would be just the cross-sectional area of this um, impact on the front of this roller. And so that's the, the way in which we, we plan to use this. Um, it might be worthwhile just doing a, a very quick kind of example to illustrate that point. I think we can do it relatively straightforwardly. So the, the bottom line is that we have two parameters which come out of this. One is the Euler number, which we have here. <coughs> multiplied through by a non-dimensional length. And one is a value of the Reynolds number. And so this ultimately gives us the Reynolds number, which is a velocity, a length, uh, what else? Density divided by viscosity. So that's what the, the second pi term was. And so you remember when we we're dealing with the, um, uh, the, the micro raptor or what it was, we put this bird in a tank and it had some, the four winged bird, right? And so what it had would be, you'd measure some uh, lift on it and you'd measure some drag force that's applied, and it'd be relative to some velocity that you're flowing over the top of it. If you remember, we saw some screens, and those screens basically gave us a magnitude, say, of, I don't know, they gave us lift, which is what they're interested in, but let's say in your model experiment, you end up with this relationship where you measure, so this is what we've done, so we're, this is our bird. Let's assume that the bird looks like this. This is just a wing. Um, let's assume that this here is this here is D. It's any characteristic length we want to choose. This length is equal to L. This is equal to the drag force that we measure in the model. And we have fluid going past this at some velocity v. I mean, that's basically what we're, we're dealing with. And so imagine, so I just thought, imagine if, for instance, we have magnitudes of the uh, velocity in meters a second, and this is one meter a second, this is 100 meters a second, and imagine we have the force that's acting on this, this is 100 newtons, and this is one newton, so this is a log scale. And we're going to have the theoretical curve that we would get would be this. It goes through 
10 meters a second and 100 newtons. So this is the drag force and this is in newtons. Completely fabricated. But the question is, so, so this is a, a raptor or whatever it is, or this flying dinosaur, or it's a plane. So maybe it's a 10th scale plane that you're flying uh, in, in a wind tunnel. And on this 10th scale plane with air, then this is the result you get. So how do you figure out whether that plane can take off? So that's basically the question you want to ask. It could be the drag. It could just as easily be the lift. Actually, let's do it the lift because it's more interesting, right? Because it allows us to scale this. Let's assume that this is the lift, not the drag. And so what would we do? Well, let's say that in the model, we can draw this um, table. And the table identifies the properties that we have. It's supposed to be a straight line. And we have length diameter, sorry, other length dimension, the, 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 the web of the wing, I suppose it would be, right? Velocity, density of the fluid, viscosity of the fluid, the change in pressure times the length times the um, uh, length of the wing. So this is, in other words, this is what we've called as uppercase P, right? The force, a pressure, multiplied by a length, multiplied by a diameter, uh, a width. And if we want to, we could calculate what the pressure is as well. And we have two systems. We have a model. And so I'm going to say that the model has, the wing length is one meter. The web is a tenth of a meter, 10 to one, just the size of it. We're flying fluid on it at 10 meters a second, which is this one. And if we do that, um, the density is of air, the viscosity is of air, and the force that we measure is 100 newtons. And so the question is, what is the magnitude of these for the prototype that we have? And the prototype is going to be a 10 to 1 scale model. So it's going to be 10 times bigger. So the length is going to be 10. The diameter, the, the thickness of the wing, if you like, is going to be one meter. Um, so in other words, if you look at these, the magnitude of length over diameter is going to be equal to some magnitude. And if you recall, the parameters that describe the behavior of this. So basically what we have, we've said we had a total of two pi groups. This is pi 1, which actually contains two groups, and this is pi 2 which contains one pi group. And so what we could do is we could think about drawing this diagram, not in terms of forces and velocities, but imagine if we could draw this diagram in terms of two different parameters. And those parameters are rho v squared, which is our Euler number, and as a function of Reynolds number, which is the velocity, some characteristic length, the density of the fluid, and the viscosity of the fluid. So if we took these results from this, we plotted it using these. In other words, we run them at a variety of different velocities. So for each Reynolds number, we would measure a different force that's applied on our structure, and so we calculate the Euler number for that. So what we do is we'd end up with a, some, some curve. And that curve would be for a length over diameter, which in our case, for our particular wing size, would be equal to 10, I guess. And if we did it for a different shape wing, we'd get different values. Maybe this is 5. I don't know whether it's up or down. But, but we could do it for different wings, and we could get different curves. But so long as the model that we're using actually has that length over diameter ratio, we know we're going to be somewhere on this curve. So what we can do is we can calculate the magnitude of the Reynolds number. So in other words, if you look at the value of these, then we want to choose a value of the Reynolds number so that these terms, velocity, um, density, and viscosity, and of course, 
It's going to be air that we use in each of these cases. And so if we want to choose the same, basically the same Reynolds number, then we can go up onto this curve. If we know what that Reynolds number is, we can come across and we can figure out what the pressure is because we know what this Reynolds number, Euler number will be. And then if we know what any velocity is that's applied to this, then we can calculate what the force will be that will be applied. And so what do we want to do in this particular case? We want to make sure that in our case we're running at the same Reynolds number. So this is, so what's Reynolds number? Reynolds number is equal to velocity, density over viscosity times length, some length scale. So if we're doing a model which is 10 times larger, but we want the same Reynolds number, then we have to reduce the velocity by a factor of 10. So in other words, if we make this number 1, then this would be the Reynolds number is constant. Don't know what it is, but it's constant for both uh, this model and it would also be constant for this prototype. So that means the number that we come up to here would give us exactly the same number of the Euler number for the prototype and for the um, model. So in other words, it has to be the same physical numerical number, whether it's 10 or 20 or whatever. So EU model equals EU prototype. And so if we know what these values are, we know delta P over rho V squared for the model is equal delta P over rho V squared for the prototype. We know the density of the fluid is air in both cases, so we don't care about that. And so if we know what the pressure is that's supplied on the model, which we know, right? We know these for all the, the cases on the model. And if we know the velocity at which that pressure was measured, then we can get the pressure that's applied on this. These aren't exponents, these are just the, the magnitudes. So if you wanted to, we could rearrange this to get what? The, the pressure applied to the prototype is equal to the pressure measured on the model multiplied by velocity on the prototype squared divided by the velocity on the model squared. And so what's that? Um, well, delta P is going to be equal to, well, this. So is it easier to do pressure? So in other words, the pressure would be, um, we'd want to, so this is a force. So this would be a pressure, this magnitude divided by this times this, which would be a tenth. So it would be 10 newtons per meter squared. And so this is equal to 10 newtons per meter squared. And this value of Vp uh, in this particular case for the prototype is equal to 1. So it's going to be equal to 10 newtons per meter squared. The velocity of the prototype is 1 meter per second squared divided by the velocity uh, of the model which is 10 um, squared, meters per second squared. So it's 100, um, so 10 divided by 100 is equal to 0 0.1 of the, so the, the pressure on the top of the wing of the prototype is equal to a tenth of the pressure of the, the model. It was, uh, well, actually a hundredth, right? So it was 10, so it's a hundredth of the, the model. And so what it allows you now to do is to figure out that the lift on this, so the force on lift is going to be delta P times the area, which in this case would be uh, 0 0.1 newtons per meter squared times 10, which is just... 1 times 10, which is equal to 1 newton per meter squared. And so we have the magnitude of this defined as a function of the velocity. And it scales with the squares of the velocity. 
And so the pressure that you apply gets scaled with the squares of the velocity. So it's one way, basically, from being a bit of a convoluted example. It kind of went on a bit longer than I hoped. But basically, you can allow experiments on a prototype to give you a relationship. Once you have that relationship, you can then use it at the appropriate Reynolds number for your system that you have. And you know that Reynolds number, the flow regime will be identical for model and prototype. And therefore, you can take the value of this Euler number, which allows you to be able to calculate the forces you're applying. So that's, that's basically it. So we've run over. I apologize slightly for that. Um, as far as I know, uh, I don't know what uh, Penn State will choose to do with classes tomorrow. It looks pretty benign out there right now. But if they do cancel classes on Tuesday, we will reschedule the test. Otherwise, and I think it's actually in your best interest to get it done tomorrow. Otherwise, we'll do it tomorrow at 6.30. So keep tuned, and I'll send you email as necessary. Thanks. Thanks.